All right, thank you, Alex. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Michelle. Uh, I've been to the city a few times before. Um, the first time I was in Brooklyn, I actually got a court summons for trespassing. Um, and so the second time I was in Brooklyn, it was to go to the court summons for trespassing. Um, and now I'm not allowed to trespass for six months, and I'm about three months clean, um, so I'm trying to be careful this time. Uh, yeah, so let's get started. Um, how many of you have ever heard of WebRTC? And how many of you have used it before? And keep your hand up if you think it's easy to use. All right, so that's basically nobody. Um, so I'm here to convince all of you today that whether you've used WebRTC or not, or if you've like used it and thought it was really, really terrible to use, um, I'm here to convince you that WebRTC can be easy. So a little bit about me. I work at Stripe, as Alex mentioned, and we are based in sunny San Francisco. Um, at Stripe, our preferred means of communication for like really important things is Google Hangouts. Um, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but Hangouts will lag, messages will appear out of order, um, sometimes take over five seconds to be delivered, and sometimes you randomly can't even connect, especially when you're at a conference and the internet's kind of shady. Um, so we could just turn around and talk to each other because we're like 10 feet away from each other. Uh, but lately I find that I can't really express myself without like a wide range of emoji available. But jokes aside, there's something a bit off about how chat works right now. Um, from client to a faraway server and then back to another client that might be right next to you. So even though I'm sitting just 10 meters away from my colleagues, my message has to travel from San Francisco all the way to the Dowels, Oregon, where the Google Data Center is, um, and all the way back to San Francisco again. And that's over 600 miles away. So this talk was originally written for Canada, so it's in meters, and I had to do a little conversion right here. Um, and so my message not only takes time to physically travel that distance, it also reaches a server where who knows what happens on the server and when it'll start its journey back to SF. So instead of this, why can't we cut out the server component and do this instead? Well, because it's hard. Um, so some of you probably know about NAT, but I'll explain it briefly. Uh, NAT is most simply a sort of IP mask and it stands for Network Address Translator, and it turns your internal IP address into a public IP address. Um, and that means if two browsers want to talk to each other, they have to figure out, A, if one or both of them are behind a NAT, and B, what each other's actual IP addresses are. Additionally, even if we were to get past the NAT and make a connection, we'd want our data to go over the wire securely so that bad people can't steal your data, and it's best to have a standard for this rather than rolling your own. And finally, his, historically, web browsers have typically used TCP as its transport protocol of choice, but for many peer-to-peer -peer applications, such as real-time games and video streams, TCP becomes too slow. So the good news is that WebRTC has solved all these issues for us. Um, and most simply, it is peer-to-peer -peer video, audio, and data in the browser. Um, WebRTC stands for Web Real-Time Communications, and it's plug-in list, meaning you can send files, uh, chat messages and stream media without having to download any apps or browser extensions. Uh, and more specifically though, it's a set of APIs, um, Get User Media, RTC Peer Connection, and RTC Data Channel. Um, so there's built-in support for NAT traversal, built-in end-to-end encryption with DTLS, and a bunch of new transport protocols that are now available. So what's cool about WebRTC is that it shifts the paradigm of the apps in the browser, uh, from centralized to decentralized, and we're entering a world where the server never has to touch any of your data. And even beyond that, it's pretty cool that you can now use UDP, which is unreliable transport, in the browser. Um, so UDP is useful for any application where order and reliability of sending messages doesn't really matter as much as if real-time games and video, um, where you can just send and forget and never have to get an act back. Uh, and it also makes available SCTP, which is a reliable transport that's presumably speedier and more secure than TCP. So I'm going to show you a quick plug-in list video chat demo. Um, let's 
just need to allow access to my webcam and audio. And I'm going to go ahead and connect to Alex. All right, okay, so that's not that cool, right? Because we're on the same network, we're all here in New York. Um, but luckily I have someone in SF. Uh, so this is Eric from SF, he's working at work right now. <laughs> all right. How did that work? How did my computer here in New York connect directly to a, another computer in San Francisco? <laughs> um, so let's walk through a simple example of raw WebRTC between uh, purple and blue. So this is a very simplified explanation of the raw WebRTC API. So if something seem, seems ma magical, I'll probably fill in the blanks later. So purple wants to make a peer-to-peer -peer connection with another client. Um, and this pseudo WebRTC should run in your browser. Uh, and Purple would first create an RTC peer connection with some configuration object. And at this point, he should decide if he wants to create data channels, so he can add a chat data channel, and maybe another one for sending files. Um, and maybe at this point, Purple also wants to have a video chat, so he will call navigator.getusermedia and um, access his webcam and mic um, and take that stream and add it to his connection. And so at this point, he's set up all of his, like, he decided what he wants to do. Um, and he now creates an offer. Um, and an offer is something called, or the format is called a uh, session description protocol, or SDP. Um, and it doesn't actually deliver any data, but it rather serves as a way of letting your peer know of your configuration, um, like what transport types you're using, um, what, your, uh, what media codec you're using. Um, and so you cache the offer locally, essentially, um, and you magically pass it to Blue, who you want to talk to. Uh, blah. And so Blue, on the other side, has magically received the offer. Um, Blue will initialize his own RTC peer connection, um, set remote description to Purple's offer, and decide what things Blue wants to share, and Blue is a little shy, so it'll only share video, um, and that, add that stream. And then Blue will create an answer, which is also a session description protocol format, um, and save the answer locally, and magically send it back to Purple. So at various points during the process, events for streams and data channels would have fired, but at this point, uh, as far as we care to know, the connection is established and all these streams and data channels are usable. Um, so yeah, that was a lot to process. So let's take a break and talk about Get User Media. Um, so Get User Media is a little bit different from these other APIs like RTC Peer Connection and RTC Data Channel um, because it's a browser API that lets you take control of your webcam and mic. Not all media streams have to be your webcam and mic stream. Um, anything that is a media stream type can be streamed on a peer connection. Um, but Get User Media was one of the first um, parts of the WebRT spec that was available in any browser, and it was as early as uh, Chrome 21 and Firefox 17, which was well over a year ago. Um, and although it's directly, not directly tied to peer-to-peer -peer connections, and you can use it without even knowing that WebRTC exists, uh, it's considered a gateway to WebRTC because um, it very early on enabled peer connections to stream media between two peers. Um, so, here's an example of something cool you can do with uh, uh, Get User Media, and this is a game where you kind of like move your head around to navigate through like a sea of dipping dots. Um, you can also ASCII-fy yourself with, from your webcam stream. And there's a bunch of other demos on uh, Shiny Demos slash Get User Media, and Shiny Demos is a opera site, and they show a bunch of cool demos, and I'll show you one right now. So, for example, this is one where it, if you give it access to your webcam, it'll tell you what color you are. 
I'm not sure where the button is. OK, so it looks like I'm mostly purple and dark colors. Yeah, so I encourage you to check out some of these really cool demos when you get the chance. There's a bunch of really cool CV things where you can use your hand um, to play games. So it's all pretty simple, theoretically, right? You have an offer, an answer, and just a very simple handshake. And of course, theoretically, it's all just supposed to work cross-platform, cross-browsers, without any plugins, and have built-in security and NAT traversal and UDP. Um, but of course, there's a but. Uh, WebRTC is much better than it was a year ago or even two months ago, but it's still a reality that it's difficult to get a grasp on how the APIs work across browsers, and um, that all depends on how to spec the different browser implementations are. And even if you force all your users to use Chrome, you have to deal with different versions of Chrome and also mobile versions. So this is a really cool browser support table from iswebrtcreadyyet.com. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of red and yellow all over the place. And these are the parts of the API that are either not up to spec in certain browsers or not yet interoperable with other browsers. Um, so I guess the answer to the question is maybe it's up ready. Um, so I wanted to make this process less of a pain, so I created and still maintain this library called PeerJS. Uh, it's sort of popular and people use it for some real things and that's kind of scary. Uh, but I'll come back to this again later. I want to take you through a bug that was reported a few months ago. Uh, there was an issue filed on PeerJS where mobile devices in Chrome 31 and 32 could not communicate with desktop browsers of the same version. So this is strange, right? So I got my hand on an Android device and checked the Chrome flag settings. In Chrome 31, SETP, the transfer protocol, uh, is supposed to be behind a flag. And if you have this flag enabled, you're able to use SETP. So here's a picture of the flag on an Android phone. Um, the story here is that I didn't, couldn't figure out how to take a screenshot within 30 seconds. Um, but it, so the flag is indeed there, um, and enabling it still doesn't allow it to communicate with browsers. So I searched the equivalent of Stack Overflow for WebRTC, which is the WebRTC-Discuss Google group, uh, which is like a less searchable equivalent of Stack Overflow. Um, and it appears that this blue bar guy here has, just knows that it's not supported until uh, 33. Um, I don't know who this guy is, and I, it took me like five minutes to get to this page where I could see like his history. Um, but he seems to know what he's talking about. Um, and after working with all this WebRTC interoperability and uh, what they call Firefox-isms, which is basically like parts of Firefox that are not up to spec, I was very inclined to believe that like Android was simply lying to me. So the bug is closed now. Um, I wrestled with a few hacks to detect whether SCTP was really enabled, but nothing really felt satisfying in that type of feature de detection. Um, and Chrome for Android Stable is now in version 34, so I just closed it because it works now. Uh, it's quite an unsatisfying ending, so let's get back on track. Uh, so there's a few missing pieces from earlier. Uh, I'll go over them briefly because they're probably out of the scope. Um, so remember the magically send function from earlier, uh, where blue just magically got his offer or answer back to purple, and purple magically got his offer back to blue? Uh, well, the peers don't just magically know how to call each other. We need what's commonly known as a signaling server to initiate their conversation. Um, so something needs to relay the offer and answer. And you might be thinking now that I've misled you about this being completely peer-to-peer. Uh, but the configuration information is all the signaling server ever touches. Uh, and once the peer connection is established, the server no longer plays any roles in the actual data transport. Um, with the caveat that uh, if you want to add another stream or change your configuration for your data channel, then you will have to renegotiate and go through that third party server again. And also, there was a dot, dot, dot configurations from earlier. So here's an example of a simple configuration for an RTC peer connection. Um, you have to pass in all these stun servers and turn servers. And here's what it looks like for some older versions of the browser, where like Firefox didn't support stun server addresses, except when they were expressed in terms of IP addresses. Um, and also, here's a sample config for a UDP data channel on some browsers and a UDP data channel on other browsers. So you can see, like, depending on the browser and the version, the configurations that they uh, support and will parse correctly uh, are completely different. 
And of course, the acronyms that you heard in the previous slide, STUN, TURN, um, they all have to do with getting past NAT. So all this magical NAT traversal that WebRTC has built in doesn't come for free. Um, there's STUN, which is session traversal utilities for NAT, and TURN, which is traversal uh, using Relay NAT, and ICE, which STUN service pass around uh, to exchange IP addresses. Um, and these are the protocols that WebRTC uses for NAT traversal. Uh, these, not, these servers are typically lightweight and on the public internet, but it does add an, another couple of third-party servers to your configuration. So now I'm going to show you a pretty scary picture. Uh, you probably can't read this slide at all, but it says, simple call flow. And this diagram is straight from the draft spec, and it's supposed to represent the smallest set of events and signaling required to make a peer-to-peer -peer connection. Uh, but of course, this includes interactions with stun and turn servers, your signaling servers, uh, ICE candidate transmission, renegotiation of offers when the peer adds a new stream, among other things. But it's really interesting if you take the time to dive in. Um, so going back to our simple peer-to-peer -peer chicken diagram, it now becomes something more like this, where you have a signaling server to relay your offer and answer, you have your stun server, um, passing around ICE candidates, and you have a turn server to fall back on if all of that fails, and then finally you're able to send your message. But the title of the talk is WebRTC Can Be Easy, and despite all the scary things I've just shown you, if you want to do cool things with WebRTC, there are, of course, a lot of libraries out there that'll make your life easier. Um, and by a lot, I mean there are like three. Um, so there's Simple WebRTC, which provides a really nice API for making media call and like chat rooms recently. Um, there's a newer one called RTC.io, which provides a bunch of smaller modules that facilitate media and data calls. Uh, I haven't really looked closely at this one myself. Um, and of course, there's PeerJS, the one I maintain, which provides an abstraction layer over peer-to-peer -peer data and media, as well as this uh, cloud server and component. And uh, yeah. So one thing that makes open source libraries a little bit, or these WebRTC open source libraries a little bit different from other libraries is that they require this bit of background knowledge about WebRTC that makes it seem scary, like after seeing all the draft spec graphs and all those scary pictures. Um, and so this makes it so that a lot of amazing developers like yourselves don't want to contribute as much. Uh, but now that you've sat through this talk, I'd like to encourage you to try your hand at contributing to some of these libraries, because it's a really exciting time for peer-to-peer -peer in the browser. Um, and I know I'm like three years late to the whole write a real-time chat app in 10 lines boat, um, but I made this demo as an effort to join in. Um, it's so, let's write some code. I'm just going to mirror this real quick. All right. So, first, I will... Uh, Make a video chat div. And uh, this library is actually called jQuery.peer, and it makes it so I can create a video chat in just one line of code. Um, so, video chat.peer, ID shell. Um, All right. Cool. So I allow access to my camera as usual. And I can connect to this other peer. And there we go. So, hello. All right. And that's it. Um, you can find me and Michelle on Twitter, and all the rest of the information is up there. Um, you can ask questions now or I'll be around after as well. <laughs>